little departure from the climate change aspect, but it is a manure gas emission. And as we go through this presentation, um, it'll show you why hydrogen sulfide gas is a concern. I do have a, a methane slide just uh, as a brief analysis in there as well. So um, what I want to do is talk to you about, uh, just introduce gypsum, its uses in agriculture, uh, why we care about hydrogen sulfide, and uh, talk a little bit about a demonstration project that we, we've uh, completed over the past couple of years in measuring hydrogen sulfide concentrations from manure storages. So gypsum is calcium sulfate. Uh, it's a naturally occurring mineral. It's also a, a coal plant byproduct. Uh, I think we all know what it is. It surrounds most of us in our homes, drywall or gypsum board. Um, manufacturing rejects and construction waste uh, can be uh, collected. Uh, uh, taking a facility such as this and, and process, and, and it's ha actually gypsum has a wide use in the agricultural industry. Uh, we incorporate it in the soil. Um, it um, improves soil structure and, pour, in, and water mobility, uh, reduces phosphorus runoff, um, retains plant available nitrogen, and provides secondary crop nutrients such as ca uh, the calcium and sulfur that is contained in gypsum. It's also actually an ideal product for bedding for dairy cows. Uh, it's inorganic, so it uh, helps control uh, bacteria counts. Um, it's great at absorbing moisture, and it has a neutral pH as opposed to lime, which some dairy farmers use. So it's not caustic to the animals. Gypsum being calcium sulfate, that sulfate portion, when it ends up in deep manure storages in an anaerobic environment, that has the potential to produce uh, sulfide. Um, and the pH ranges we're at with dairy manure, um, hydrogen sulfide is the dominant species. Why do we care about hydrogen sulfide gas? Um, it's very dangerous gas at low concentrations. Uh, in general industry, it doesn't like to see exposures over 20 parts per million. Um, it's immediately dangerous to life and health at 100 parts per million. Okay, so again, just a couple numbers to keep in mind as we go through the presentation. Um, very deadly gas at low concentrations. Uh, probably all seen this. Um, I'll just take it for, for granted, but this really, really tells a story. When we, a farmer goes and agitates and mixes their manure storage, um, this is what you see. After, uh, once we break through the crust of the manure, start moving that manure around, the uh, manure gases start to escape. And if hydrogen sulfide is present, in very short time periods, that hydrogen sulfide is going to escape in large balloons and, and elevated concentrations, which can be, uh, create a very dangerous environment. Uh, the study was brought about by some incidents that, that occurred in, in New, New York, uh, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. Um, Gypsum farm, which however was found unresponsive here uh, near the gutters. Uh, three workers died at a Maryland storage uh, at a farm that was bedded with gypsum. Um, this is a farm in Montour County. Uh, the farm began agitating his manure storage. Uh, a few minutes later, walked around and found his, uh, two boys, their ages two and four at the time, passed out and blew in the face. Thankfully, they were rescued, no harm was done. Uh, but this isn't always the, always the case. Um, Penn State Extension personnel have found elevated hydrogen sulfide levels at, at, at this particular site. Uh, you can see 100, five to 600 parts per million uh, near the perimeter of the manure storage. Uh, a little bit after that, 100 parts per million. Remember, immediately dangerous to life and health at 100 parts per million. Um, we've also gotten calls from uh, uh, county officials and fire departments up in Massachusetts, um, upstate New York, who have observed the, the uh, similar elevated concentrations of hydrogen sulfide. Uh, 30 feet away, this is the same site where the two boys were passed out, 30 feet away we're getting uh, levels of 30 to 60 parts per million hydrogen sulfide. Um, 50 feet away, 50 parts per million. So um, this, you know, you know, this is start to, a concern starts to arise about the safety um, uh, of the hazardous environment when working around a manure storage. Um, what this led to was a demonstration project. People started to be concerned, but there, there, there was an anecdotal link between farms that use gypsum bedding and hydrogen sulfide gas emissions. I think the dairy industry is used to methane. A lot of safety incidences have been attributed to elevated methane concentrations, but dairy industry, a lot of, I, I don't think, um, prior to, to uh, recently, have really been concerned about hydrogen sulfide gas. The swine industry has, but it's not as prevalent in the uh, dairy industry. Um, we uh, 
completed a demonstration project where we looked at uh, farms in three different categories. Farms that used gypsum bedding, farms that did not use gypsum bedding, more traditional bedding, and farms that used uh, gypsum bedding with some sort of treatment that they added to the manure storage um, that was uh, reported to uh, reduce hydrogen sulfide emissions. How do we measure these hydrogen sulfide emissions? We partnered with a company, Industrial Scientific, and make portable gas monitors. Uh, what I did with these, they, they, they donated a fleet of these, these uh, instruments to us, and I placed them around the perimeter of the storage. Went to 10 different farms in the fall and the spring, and uh, measured hydrogen sulfide emissions during agitation events. Uh, we also put a meter on, personal meter on the operator during agitation. We also placed a couple meters, uh, 10, 10 meters away from the down, at the downwind direction of the north storage. Record environmental data, uh, temperature, ambient temperature, wind speed, wind direction. Try to characterize the manure storage too. Um, you know, we want a kind of full characterization. Not every farm that used gypsum bedding had has uh, safety <coughs> incidents. Uh, so we wanted to characterize the manure. Um, did the manure have a crust over it? If so, how thick was it? What percentage of the manure storage was uh, was crusted over? And uh, took samples of the manure, characterized the composition. And we also documented some manure handling practices. Was the manure top loaded into the long term storage daily, twice a day? Um, other farms that I was at had a uh, transfer sump that, you know, a couple times a month from that sump that would transfer over to the uh, long term storage. Also, tried to get an idea of uh, loading inputs, other sulfate sources that might uh, contribute to hydrogen sulfide production, copper sulfate foot baths. Many dairies use these um, on the, for cows and the way to milking. Um, and distiller's grains are also a, can be a sulfate source in the diet. Quick look at the, uh, you know, just kind of the raw data. Uh, so what we're looking at is farms in three different categories. The non-gypsum farms, gypsum farms, farms that had some sort of treatment. A couple things I want to point out with this slide. I set up my instruments prior to agitation. And you can see that I plugged the first 20 minutes. You can see as soon as agitation starts, that's when we start to get some noise. That's when we start to get some elevated hydrogen sulfide concentration. So as soon as we break through that crust, as soon as, as, soon as we start mixing that manure around, that's when we start to see elevated levels. Um, the other thing I think is pretty apparent, non-gypsum farms versus uh, the farms that have gypsum. Non-gypsum farms, I can tell you, they were, it was never above 10 parts per million. Uh, as soon as we add gypsum into the mix, that starts to create a, a potential risk, a potential hazard um, from what we saw. So, through this demonstration project, you know there there is a scientific link there with farms that use gypsum better. Okay, important data here. Um, so I needed a way to look at this data. All different farms use different amounts of gypsum better. Okay, so what I did was take the first 60 minutes of agitation and added all those hydrogen sulfide concentrations up. So this is a cumulative hydrogen sulfide concentration after 60 minutes. What I was able to do with that is just plot one point for each different farm. And I plotted that against gypsum application rate in terms of pounds per cow per day. Um, pretty clear trend. Uh, the more gypsum that's used, the cumulative hydrogen sulfide concentrations increased. Um, these uh, red squares here are the farms that had a, a treatment that they added into the manure storage pit that was reported to reduce, reduce hydrogen sulfide concentrations. Looks like there's a trend here. Um, this was not statistics, statistically significant, um, but I think some more uh, more data points. You know, it's, it's hard to get as many farms as, as, as go out and measure as many farms as we can. Um, so some more data here I think would, would go a long way in uh, proving this treatment. Um, I want to point out this farm over here. There's actually two data points here. This is a farm that had the highest gypsum application rate. Didn't fall anywhere where we expected. Um, Every time I went to this farm, it was it was a no. There was never any crust on the storage. It was a liquid lagoon. Um, what we think was going on there was the hydrogen sulfide was allowed to be released over time because there was no crust. Instead of breaking through the crust, you have these big blooms, a short-term event that were released lots of hydrogen sulfide at one time. Uh, my belief is that hydrogen sulfide was allowed to be released over over time. So we had a lot less uh, concentrations during the agitation events. Um, the other nice thing to point out is you can see a couple of these. There's two points here, a couple points here, two points here. This was a fall event and a spring event. 
Um, so I really have a lot of confidence in our methodology, um, being able to capture the hydrogen, cumulative hydrogen sulfide emissions. Um, so the other thing that tells me is there wasn't really a, a fall, a seasonal effect on hydrogen sulfide emissions. Um, there wasn't a temperature effect on that. Some observations. Um, this is a farm that I, we uh, visited three different times, two fall events and one spring event. And talking to the farmer, and both two of the three times I was there, predominantly the wind direction is to the east, represented by the red arrows here, um, blowing out into to an open field over the manure storage. Um, last, this is actually uh, just last fall, I was out at the farm. Um, wind direction had completely changed. So I looked at my field notes, storm had just blown in, day was overcast. She really changed the wind direction, and what's interesting here is you can really see the difference of a change in wind direction. Uh, you know, the two times it was about you know 60, 70 parts per million. Whenever that wind direction changed, it's blowing directly into a heifer barn uh, that's proximate to the north storage. It's kind of holding back that wind, um, and the hydrogen sulfide concentrations are not dissipating as readily as as if the wind were blowing in an open field. Got over 500 parts per million. Max my meters out. That's as high as I can measure. So, uh, potentially dangerous environment here. So, wind direction, um, you know, impeding uh, structures can can really affect hydrogen sulfide concentrations. The other set of observations we collected is personal personal monitoring device on the uh, operator themselves during the agitation event. This is actually very surprising to me. Um, Despite the elevated concentrations around the perimeter of the manure storage, um, most of the time farmers were exposed to 10 parts per million or less. Um, this is what we typically found. Hydrogen sulfide is a dense, heavy gas. It's going to sit in low-lying areas. Um, farmers, when they're elevated off, off the ground, uh, in the closed cab of their tractor operating the agitator controls, um, that awareness, that practice really limited their exposure was not always the case. There were a few times that uh, we did get elevated uh, exposures on the operators. Uh, for whatever reason, they had to be at the rim of the, of the manure storage, whether uh, manually pointing the agitator nozzle, or this is day this gentleman's uh, drive chain broke, so he's kind of leaning over, uh, you know, repairing it and adjusting things. Um, just goes to show it's an interesting data set. That really, awareness can really go a long way in limiting your risk of exposure. Uh, you know, at 300 parts per million, 500 parts per million, one breath, you pass out, you're going to fall in that manure storage. That's a, that's a big problem. Um, so, if it's if we're getting 300 out here, um, just think what it is right at the surface where your head's going to be. Uh, the other set of observations, concentrations, this was 10 meters away, so 30, 30, about 30 feet downwind of the the perimeter of the manure storage. Um, you can see the non-gypsum farms, this really tells the same story. Non-gypsum farms had, had uh, uh, lower hydrogen sulfide concentrations than the couple of than the, the gypsum farms that we observed. Um, now, not all of them had elevated concentrations, but I went back and, and with all my characterization of the farms, I started to take a look, and there's reasons that not everybody had elevated concentrations. A couple of the farms had that manure transfer. They, uh, Scrape into the end, sunk into the end of the barn. Whenever they transfer to long term storage, you know, every couple weeks, whenever they're moving that manure, so they would agitate and get rid of all that hydrogen sulfide. So, whenever I went to measure it, it had already escaped during that transfer. Um, it's one farm that didn't have the crust, uh, uh, and a couple farms I went to, we tried to get first season, first agitation of the season. That didn't, wasn't always the case. I'm sure we're all familiar with uh, how difficult field work can be sometimes. Uh, methane, I did throw a methane slide in here. So it was a gas I measured, wasn't the focus of the project. Um, but I did want to throw this slide and do a little brief analysis uh, being a climate change conference. Um, what was good to see, I did have higher methane concentrations in the fall, lower uh, concentrations in the springtime. This matches the literature, temperature is going to affect uh, methane production as opposed to hydrogen sulfide, then have a seasonal, can have a temperature effect. I did see that with methane, that agrees with the literature. Um, first thing that uh, I noticed, this is cumulative methane concentrations over 60 minutes, pretty low, right? Um, 
My first thought was looking at this is in the redox hierarchy, sulfate, if sulfate's present, that's going to be the terminal electron acceptor and potentially prevent methanogenesis from occurring. But I don't think this was the case because I've done three different bench scale studies with in uh, closed vessels with just a, a passive barb for gas to release. Um, I was creating, I did get high concentrations of methane um, in the bench scale analysis. What I think was happening here and uh, what I think is pointing out is these are open air storages, so we're outside. We're not in any kind of confined space. Um, methane's a lot lighter than hydrogen sulfide. I think that methane is just dissipated that much more easily. Uh, took a look at ammonia. Uh, no trend here, um, which makes sense. Uh, gypsum's a neutral pH, so it's not going to affect the pH of the manure. Okay, so it's not going to have any effect on that ammonium versus ammonia. Uh, so a few conclusions, increased gypsum use. Gypsum provides that ammunition, that sulfate source to cre create uh, elevated hydrogen sulfide emissions. Uh, the treatments, they didn't significantly affect hydrogen sulfide emissions. Looked like there was a trend there. I think some more data would be useful. Um, moving or mixing the manure, I think we found anytime you move or mix the manure, that's going to allow the hydrogen sulfide to escape. Um, we see, we've seen uh, safety practices. Uh, can help reduce the risk of exposure. And um, that data set that I had the meters, uh, you know, 30 feet away, even if you're not uh, an operator or farmer working right around the rim of the storage, if your kids are playing around the storage, you have animals there, still risk of exposure, right? Still potentially dangerous environment. Um, so, you know, this is really, uh, Went a long way in, in helping us, uh, you know, tease out some high, elevated hydrogen sulfide and dressing awareness. I, I do appreciate being here to, to talk about this and, and you know create this awareness. It's a great opportunity anytime I can talk about um, the dangers of working around any kind of manure storages. Um, so I do want to thank the Penn State investigators, uh, Eileen Fabian, who was going to be here. Um, I took her place today. Uh, Dave Hill and Dennis Murphy. Um, both at Penn State. Dave Hill was one of the extension folks that was out in the field uh, measuring elevated hydrogen sulfide uh, emissions before uh, we actually got this demonstration project. Uh, Robin Branch, crucial to help us get the proposal off, and Chip Elliott and Rob Minan um, helped really get the field work underway. Uh, USDA FDA investigators, Al Ross and Ray Bryant on my committee, big help. Um, USDA is a uh, conservation innovation grant, so we got funding from the USDA, uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, as well as the State Conservation Commission from PDA. Um, we actually also have an industry partner as well. Uh, Terry Weaver is the CEO of USA Gypsum. So he is an owner of, of the gypsum manufacturing plant. Um, really went a long way to, to help us address the concerns uh, that potentially his product, product it had, has an effect on. Um, industrial Scientific, um, the folks that donated the meters to us. Um, they're typically in gas monitoring, we used them as a research mode, but the benefit of this is I had a mul multiple army of meters that I could you know, surround the storage with. Uh, so great, great folks to work with. Um, and with that, I'll, I'll invite questions. <laughs>